Hi everyone and welcome to another video for algorithms and data structures. This one is all about space complexity. Now normally for stuff where I present slides like this, oh, I should point to the other side, I'm still getting used to this, I would use a bit of Kolesha Gamma. But unfortunately something went wrong with one of the recordings so I had to redo this bit. For this I'm in the do-it-yourself studio that we have at the university. It's great but as you may have noticed in my glasses occasionally you will see the light being reflected. I'm not quite sure what I can do about it. I could look like this, but that doesn't look great. So for now, it will have to make do. So in this video, I want to talk to you a little bit about space complexity. So what we've already seen is something to do with what we call time complexity. How much time does it take to run a function? Today, we're not going to look at time, but instead we're going to look at space, another dimension that's relevant. Why? Well, time is not the only finite resource. Space is also a finite resource. Which means that even if something is very, very fast, if it uses a lot of memory, a lot of space, it might still not be the ideal algorithm, the ideal solution to our problem. Now, unfortunately, there is something else that we need to understand if we want to analyze space complexity. For those of you who study computer science, well, you might get some flashbacks to assembly programming, but don't worry, we're not going to be talking about assembly. For the mathematicians among you, you probably have no idea what I'm talking about, but don't worry, I'll guide you through it. So the question is, is there a difference at all between how we analyze time and how we analyze space? And the answer is yes, there is. And it has to do with a very simple observation that space is something we can reuse. Imagine that I'm currently parking my car somewhere. I'm using the parking space. But as soon as I take my car out, someone else can use it. The space can be reused. But the time during which my car was parked there cannot be reused. So yes, space can be reused, but time cannot. Okay. So this fundamental difference, let's see how this impacts our analysis. And to do this, we need to know a little bit about memory in a computer. So I've taken some slides from a colleague of mine, Robert Krebers, uh, and I want to tell you a little bit, not too much detail, but just a little bit about how memory works inside a computer and how our programs can access this memory, can access this space. And for this, we take a look at what happens when we call a function. When we call a function, we say that a stack frame is added to memory. Okay, sounds fancy. So what does that mean? Well, imagine that I'm currently just in my main program, right? In Python, I've called my script, or in Java, I've called the main function. Uh, and from this main, I'm calling a function f. At that point, a stack frame for f will be added to my memory, to my stack. And then in f, I call another function, I call g, so again a stack frame is added on top. Now what are these stack frames? Well, these stack frames contain a bit of information that the functions need to execute. For instance, all of the function arguments, if I say print hello world, then hello world in some way, that's argument, will be represented in the stack frame. The local variables, if I create a new variable inside the function, this will be stored in the stack frame. But perhaps most importantly, once the function is done, it needs to know what to do next. Where did I come from? Where do I need to go? And for this, we also store the return address on the stack. So, function arguments, local variables, and also the return address. Now, what about when a function is done? When we return from a function? Well, in that case, we remove the stack frame and we use this return address to know where we need to go back to. So imagine that function g is done. What happens? Well, we remove the stack frame. So stack frame for g gets removed from our stack. This space is freed up and it can be reused for something else. So in this example, we use three different functions, main, f, and g. But a question you may ask is, well, is it possible for multiple different stack frames to belong to the same function? So rather than having main, f and g, is it possible for f to have two stack frames, for instance? And the answer is yes, this is possible. Why? 
Well, through the power of recursion. This thing where a function calls itself. So let's take a look at what that looks like. So here's a bit of code. Two functions, bar and foo. And what we're going to do is we're going to call foo with the parameter 3. So here we go. The first thing that we do is we create a stack frame for this function foo. And it stores these three things. The argument to the function, n equals 3. It reserves some space for local variables, in this case res. And it remembers where it needs to go back to once it's done, which is somewhere in the main function. Now, of course, in reality, the program knows exactly where it needs to go back to, but since we don't know what main is, I've just put main here on the slide. Okay, so it executes one line. Now res has a value, right? We've assigned the value 8 to our variable res. Left and right or the other way around in the studio. Still need to get used to that. Okay, so we've done this. What's next? Well, now we get to a recursive or we get to a call. We call the function bar. And when we call the function bar, what happens? Well, we create a stack frame for our call to bar with the parameter 3. We need to store the parameter n. And we need to know that once we're done, we need to go back to line 8, because that's where we were just before. Okay, so let's take a look. Well, n is not smaller than 1, so we get to line 4. Ah, and now we make a call to bar again. So we create another stack frame. This time with n equals 2. We know that once we're done, we need to go back to line number 4. We take a look. What happens? Well, n is still larger than 1, so once again we go to line 4, and once again we make a recursive call. So we add another stack onto our stack frame. And there we go. n equals 1. We return to line 4 once we're done. And let's take a look. Finally, n is, larger, is smaller than or equal to 1. So this time we get to line 3. Line 3 says, OK, we're done here. We can return number 1. The, n the number 1, I should say. So we do this, and what we return. So we go back to this line 4 that we were at before. OK, this now has all the information it needs. It can add the numbers together, and it can return to the line 4 that it was before. So now we're all the way back into bar with the parameter 3. OK, this now is all the information. It adds them together and it can return. And now we get to line 9. Line 8 is done. It has updated res. It has added 6. Because if you kept track, 3 plus 2 plus 1 equals 6. So res has become 14. And now this thing is also done, ready to return. It can return to main and the stack is empty. Well, this part of the stack that we've been looking at is empty. Of course, main will still have a part on this stack, containing some local variables, maybe even some arguments, and of course, a return address for when it's done, whatever that may be for a main function. Okay, so what does this mean? Well, we've seen a few things. We've seen that calling a function takes space. And that's very important when we deal with recursive, recursive, recursive functions. I mentioned here that we will discuss it after the break. Well, these are lecture slides. There is no break. There's just a video. But we will discuss this in more detail in one of the next videos or one of the tutorials, if you are a mathematics student. And you should also remember that all of the parameters that we store also take a bit of space. Not a lot, but at least a little bit. And then there is one question I would still like to address before we finish this video, which is, well, does that mean that if I call a function, let's call it baz, and I give it a list as a parameter, does that require linear space? Right? Because a list, well, if a list has n items, we need to store all of them, so the list would take n space. But does it mean that if I call a function with a list, the stack frame then requires linear space? That would be terrible, right? Well, fortunately, that's not the case. And that's because rather than copying the full list and giving it to a function, we only give it a reference. So this means that even a call that takes a list as input still requires only constant space. 
Now I've included a link here, I'll also include it in the description of the video, that gives you a bit more information about how this works exactly, if you're interested in that. The main thing for you to remember is that all of the parameters of the function take only constant space, which means that it's possible for a function that operates on lists to require only constant space, because the input is not part of the space complexity of the function. But again, we'll see some more examples of this when we practice with it later on. For this video, we've come to the end. And I hope you know a little bit more about space complexity and also about how space works inside a computer. About how when you call a function, you build a stack frame, and when you're done with the function, you break it down and you release this space, ready to be reused again. And with that, well, I'm afraid that as I told you, time is not reusable, so I hope you found this video somewhat useful. See you around for the next one.